in any detail but I will show a, a picture of these so uh, let me explain now so from the start uh, the couple <laughs> basically is a um, in Scotland the, the, the name that, uh, that has been given to a, a crook shaped so arch shaped uh, timber truss timber uh, roof supporting structure and I'll show a picture of these uh, later on at least the way that I've modeled these into my, my reconstruction models <laughs> Uh, building on buildings that is the, the title of my um, somewhat methodologically inspired uh, uh, presentation for today just to start off with a, a bit of a background information on the, the geophysical setting um, of my, my research area I've looked at the, the northern part of the Netherlands uh, where we don't have any any stones in the, in the subsoil and this has led this is one of the reasons that um, uh, settlement archaeology in this area is uh, largely characterized by uh, large excavation uh, trenches producing uh, fairly large numbers of, of house plans and this has led to a, a research tradition largely based on uh, the typological classification of these excavated house plans. So this is a, a geophysical map of the region where um, the yellows indicate uh, sandy uh, subsoils, largely windblown the browns are uh, the peat moors and the, the darker greens along the northern uh, littoral is a, is a salt marsh area and that's the, 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 the core area of, of my research uh, area. So um, in the last few years there's, there's been an increase in uh, critique on this typological approach uh, for it not having moved much beyond a basic classification of the excavated ground plans. On the other hand there's also been critique on the more interpretive approaches to these house plans and, and sometimes it is felt that um, these interpretations are pushing a bit beyond what can safely be said on the basis of the, the excavated archaeological evidence. However, during my research, as I'm also looking at the reconstructions, so there's also a lot of structural uh, approach uh, mixed into these, uh, these typo typological analysis and the more contextualizing uh, activities, I felt that these should not be regarded as two opposing methodologies, but rather both ends of a single uh, research process, starting off with the basic classification, if you will, uh, of your material. Um, and then ending up with this uh, contextualization. And this is something that I've, I wouldn't, it might not be a methodology in, in, in the true sense of the word, but it's uh, as a framework that I've set up, which I, I've called the, fun the functional typology, as it strives to look at the, the development of buildings uh, and, and look at how they functioned in their different uh, settings. So, from a typological point of view, also with regard to the use of space, uh, which of course is a topic for today, uh, the technolo technology involved in building these structures, um, and, and, and these form the three first steps of my approach to, this, uh, to these house plans. And I try to make these as objective as can be, and only after that I've gone through these first three stages will I move on towards making the actual reconstruction models, uh, as these are highly interpretive, as you can imagine. Uh, and this uh, should provide a, a good, solid foundation for then uh, a contextualization of the of the archaeological evidence. So um, I'll, I'll try and illustrate this on the basis of the the, the house plans that I've uh, I've looked at, and I've, I've boiled the, the house plans down to idealized house plans for uh, for today, and I've plotted them on the geophysical map. And because of the the well, a large amounts of the uh, the excavated house plans come from the, the sandy area all the way to the right. And so there's, uh, well, most archaeologists in the Netherlands would be familiar with, uh, with the, these post-built timber buildings, which uh, basically are five to six meter wide buildings with posts on the outside, at least for the, uh, for the, for the early medieval period, uh, around the 8th century. And then in the salt marsh area, where we have no timber because no timber or no wood can grow on these, these salt marsh uh, settings, 
there it was a, a turf building tradition. And from an archaeological point of view, looking only at the ground plans, these uh, have long seemed to be two very different types of architecture. And it's only when you're going through this, this typological analysis and you're widening your horizon, also to include, for example, the west of the Netherlands, that it becomes obvious that these are not as different as they would appear at first glance. For example, along the west coast we have uh, very similar to timber buildings as to, uh, in, the, in the northeast, but with a uh, partially three-aisled interior, which is, is the buyer area. And this is a feature that also occurs in, in some of the uh, turf buildings. Further north on the salt marsh we have turf buildings which have a row of posts uh, along the inside of the, of the wall. So it's already a combination of turf and timber uh, uh, structure emerging from, from the ground plants. And there's even a hybrid form known from, from one of the islands where we have a, a proper post-built uh, longhouse, but a buyer uh, <coughs> built as a, a basically a turf house, having all the features that you'd expect in the, in the other turf houses. So there's, when you widen this, this geogra geographical perspective, it becomes obvious that a lot of the features are shared throughout the north of the Netherlands. They're all five to six, sometimes six and a half meters wide. Um, they have very similar layouts. There's mostly three-partite, uh, tripartite uh, uh, layouts, and this, this uh, <coughs> implies that there's something of a shared design concept. Um, then I haven't looked at um, in the use of space in, in terms of uh, looking at floor levels, etc. I've limited myself to a, a type, typology based analysis, but also these, these ground plans can already say a lot about the use of the interior room. As I showed, these uh, partially three aisle interiors. These are specific for the, the, uh, the buyer area. And as they don't continue throughout the entire uh, interior, it's, it's obvious that they are not part of the roof supporting structure. So, uh, my interpretation, as I'll also show later on, would be that these uh, supported a loft. Um, and it's very interesting that also from, uh, from approximately the, the late 7th, early 8th century. There's also an increase in evidence for a fixed buyer layout. So these are two features um, that provide uh, some means of, of uh, establishing the use of the interior and point towards an increase in uh, collecting manure. So the, these might may tie in, and, and of course storage, as far as the loft is concerned. So these might tie into uh, changes in agricultural activities and perhaps an increase in agricultural production um, being uh, borne out by the uh, by the house plans. Uh, the third stage then would be an inventory of all the technological evidence, and this is something that hasn't really been carried out in particular for turf construction, uh, but the preservation in this area is is, is very good, and uh, quite often uh, excavations have revealed turf walls standing up to even 70 centimeters in height, uh, and showing also evidence for bonding systems used with regard to the, to the turf walls. As far as the timber constructions are concerned, uh, there seems to be a structural emphasis on the posts outside of the wall, where, which is uh, somewhat surprising as these have in general been regarded as, a, as something of a buttress to, to take only the, the outward pressure of the, the roof structure. Um, but these, um, I think, are actually the, the roof supporting elements, so basically the trusses there are, there's no evidence for any um, uh, timber roof supporting structure in most of the, uh, in, in the turf houses, with the only exception being uh, the example I gave earlier on, which has the, the turf stand of the, the timber, sorry, uh, just in front of the turf wall. But the northern examples don't have any posts apart from the uh, three aisles uh, interior that sometimes is present in the buyer. Um, and what that means I'll get to, to later on. Uh, and there's also evidence, as I said, on the, the bonding systems, for example, of the, the turf walls as well as thicknesses. So this, these three steps of typology, uh, the basic classification that is of your ground plans, um, what they tell you about the, the use of space and what technological evidence we have, I've all fed this into uh, a series of reconstruction models. 
Um, and therefore, the early medieval period, my conclusion is that the uh, contrary to, to uh, earlier interpretations, is that the roof structure is actually based on a, a well, as Tanya said, a couple shaped a truss, uh, trusses, trusses, and arch shaped trusses. Um, and this is the general uh, development starting in the 6th uh, century and then onto the 7th, the, the structure gradually moves outwards. And then here's the situation that I showed for, um, for the 8th century um, and, and the boat shaped uh, variation to that. So basically, these are the, the loads, uh, roof supporting elements standing outside of the wall. And into the medieval period, um, uh, developments take place that look a lot more like the, uh, the situation we have in historical buildings in the Netherlands. And even though the starting point and the end point are quite different from each other, um, in my reconstruction models it shows that this could have been a, a gradual development taking place over a long period. And then when I fit that back into the turf house design, using also the, the hybrid form that we've, we've recognized on the, one of, one of the, the modern sea islands, um, it, it comes out that the, the turf wall is the actual load-bearing element in the structure. And as I said, also these turf buildings and timber buildings being very closely related in a structural sense. So going through this process, I feel that there's a a possibility of, of establishing a, a good solid foundation for a more contextualizing approach to the building to the buildings um, I've, I've shown that the turf houses themselves are part of a, of a, of a wider house building tradition and the differences are mainly in the regional differences are mainly down to differences in choices of building material also the high quality of turf construction that was achieved um, already in the 6th century in, the, in, the, in the, the salt marsh area I think is an indication for a long-standing tradition as it would take a, um, a quite a, some evolving for this high quality of turf construction to evolve and as it's known that in the 5th uh, century there's an influx of, or actually a recolonization of this salt marsh area uh, with Anglo-Saxon migrations coming in from northwest Germany and, and Denmark um, uh, my interpretation is that the actual tradition of building a turf house is in fact an Anglo-Saxon tradition. So this is a cult cultural component uh, coming through. Then to conclude, um, I would say that typology, despite its critique in the last few years, it does provide a good uh, starting point as a, as a basic classification for your data, as would any archaeological um, specialist looking at, uh, at materials also classify their, their materials prior to analyzing them any further. And then on the route towards a more contextualizing uh, synthesis of, of the material, there should be a, a central place for a structural approach, something in which also experimental archaeology can have a, have a part. This is something I'll go into in more detail, as you can see. We've done something on experimental archaeology as well, but I'll, I'll deal with this in another presentation tomorrow. And then um, this whole process, which I've, I've called a functional typology, but there's, there's room for discussion afterwards, so I'm curious to find out any other approaches that could, could work or uh, could contribute to this. Um, my idea is that there's a, a process of gradually peeling away all the different elements that are uh, of influence on the design of the buildings, and of course um, uh, geophysical circumstances would be one of these. I've mentioned agricultural developments which can influence the, the house designs. And of course, as I've uh, mentioned, cultural elements also influencing architectural developments. So I'll, I'll leave it with that. Thank you.